Well, uh, let me, I'd like to give you a definition when we're talking about the high ground. I'm talking about the high ground in, uh, on a spiritual level and in our relationship with God. But the, the, the whole term about the high ground is defined this way. If a person has the high ground, they're in the best and most successful situation. It is a position of advantage superiority, and dominance. High ground gives you the edge. It gives you the upper hand over opponents. Now, if there is an enemy of our soul, the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10, it says the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And we would surely like to have the upper hand, would we not? <clears throat> and to foil his attempts at our life to discourage us or hurt us in any, any possible way. But the high ground throughout the Bible, you'll read and it'll talk about high ground, you know. And it's really about a relationship we can have in the Almighty God. I'd like to read you something out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, beginning in verse 8. <clears throat> God says, he says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. So if, if you know uh, an individual who is a human being, that's not the way God thinks. <laughs> okay, if, if you see a movie or you read a book, just by just a secular human being, that's not the way God thinks. Now, we can learn God's ways and, and God's thoughts, but it doesn't naturally come just by being born on this planet. Listen to what he says here. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. What happens if, if somebody punches you? What is our natural thought? Punch them back. back harder, you know. That's not the way God thinks. He says, my thoughts, well, what does he tell us to do? When slaps, someone slaps in the cheek, turn the other cheek, you know. But throughout the life, we see opposites of our natural human tendency, you know. But he says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are... Far beyond anything you could imagine. God's ways are far beyond our human natural ways. That's what he's telling us here. Like a parent. How many parents do we have here? Okay, imagine your child is two months old, okay? Two months old. Are your child's thoughts and your thoughts alike? <laughs> no, so you can understand how your thoughts are further beyond a, a two-month-old child. So we can understand that God's thoughts are further beyond ours. And our goal is that a child would learn mom and daddy's thoughts, right? As they mature. So he says here, I'm going to read once again, Isaiah 55, verse 8 says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Verse 9 says, For just as the heavens are higher than the earth... And you know what, if they had a shot a rocket a hundred years ago, if there was enough fuel to do it, if they could have shot a rocket that is just going up and 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 up for the past hundred years, it still hasn't hit the end. You know what I'm saying? It's still going to go for another million years or so if we had the fuel. And he says, for just as the heavens are higher than the earth, God says, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are are higher than your thoughts. But see, we can learn God's thoughts. And we can learn God's ways. And what we're talking about here today, if, if you want to access and tap into a godly, a holy power that is from the almighty God and access, I'm talking about where, where you know, prayers are answered. Access in the supernatural where God hears and answers our prayers and wonderful, fantastic things happen in our life. Well, then what we want to do is we want to grab a hold of the high ground. We want to learn the highways and we want to begin to think high thoughts. You know, um, God, God's given us a fantastic book, you know, where we can learn his thoughts and his ways. And I forgot something. Let me go grab it. I didn't leave it out here nowhere, did I? No, I don't think so. 
a little, little something. Now all I need is a volunteer. I'm teasing about a volunteer, okay? Now what do we call this? A high chair. And that's where we put the, the young and the immature. Is that right? We put them in a high chair, you know, and this high chair is kind of like being incarcerated, you know? <laughs> they got these belts that you attach around the kid. Two different belts in here. And this tray locks in. There's no escape. They might pry up one level, but they'll not get the big one with the locks on it, you know? Now, uh, uh, a child who was put in a high chair may look and see from a distance the high ground that the mature people have able to access. But when you're in the high chair, you can only see it at a distance. You're not free to access the high ground, not when you're, you know, locked up in a high chair. Now, this is going to relate to you, your spiritual well-being. Are you pursuing the high ground? Are you, you, have you laid hold of the high ground? Or are you clinging desperately to the high chair, which is evidence of immaturity, you know? <laughs> so think about it for a moment. You know, how does this relate to you? Um, you know, I'm talking about a spiritually mature person does not cling to the high chair. Listen to what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 24. It says, friends, stay where you are called to be. God is there. Hold, what does that say? Hold the high ground with him at your side. Hold the high ground. Throughout the Bible, it refers to the high ground and higher ground. He says, hold the high ground. It gives you an advantage. If you ever watch, what was that movie? Gettysburg. And you'll see when they're getting ready to have a, a battle there, you know, this powerful, massive war. They always, they were using, you know, like muzzle loaders and bayonets and all. And, and the people who were going to win the battle for the most part are those who had the high ground. And he says here, hold the high ground with him at your side. So you're going to choose the high ground on, on a spiritual level, or some are going to hold to and choose the high chair. Now, the high chair is more about me, myself, and I. You know what I'm saying? Y'all been around little people who, who the very first word they learned was, no. <laughs> Have you discovered that, you know? That's. That's just the way it is, you know? And not too far after that, it's like, mine, 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 mine. And then go to a friend's house, and they're fighting with another kid. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And the person who actually owns the toy is sitting over there playing with something different, you know? But there's this in immaturity, you know, uh, when you're clinging to the high chair. And you can't totally be trusted, you know. You, you end up sleeping in your spaghetti, you know, and stuff like that. You got spaghetti all over your face and green peas mashed everywhere. You got milk and orange juice spilled everywhere. There's a big mess. My brother was telling me on the way in, he said, we used to have our dog. And our dog would lay down underneath the high chair because, you know, he would get fed well, you know. But it's all about me when you cling to the high chair. But let me ask you, you know, and that's okay at a certain age. But you know, and it's really genuinely heartbreaking. It really is, because I know some people, you know, great people, but they're bound to the high chair and they're in their mid 30s, 40s, and something's wrong. You know, they, they, they can't do it without the high chair. But see, we want to mature physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, do we not? Yes. You know, we, we, want, we don't want to be bound to the high chair on a spiritual level. At all, or even physically, to be honest with you. But he says here, friends, stay where you were called to be. God is there. Hold the high ground with him at your side. Hmm. Amen. The high chair only enables you to see the high ground, but you don't have the freedom to access it. Listen to what it says here in Romans 8. Y'all know that's my favorite verse. But Romans 8, chapter 28, it says, 
And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And see, God's purpose is for you to hold the high ground. As any parent wants their child to outgrow the high chair, almighty God, he wants us to outgrow the spiritual high chair and get a hold of the high ground and have an awesome, fantastic relationship with him. So Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, If you then be risen with Christ, risen with Christ, this is talking about high ground. If you then be risen with Christ, you've accepted Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you're growing in your relationship with him. He says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, the higher things that we are learned. His ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher, higher than ours. He says, if you then be risen with Christ in your relationship with him, seek those things which are above where Christ, he sits on the right hand of God. You know, and that's not the high chair, but that's the high ground. And he says in verse 2, he says, set your affection. Your affection is talking about your love. It's talking about the things that you like, you know, your, your, your liking. It's talking about your fondness. And he says, if you have been risen with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Verse 2 says, set your affection on things above not on the things of this earth. See, you see the value of things from God's perspective. perspective. A, what a child here clinging to the high chair, the things that he values are probably not as important as what you value. You know, some little old smurfy thing or some little something or another, that's not near as important to you as you mature. You know, and you grow and you understand responsibility a little bit more. But he's telling us in verse 2, set your affection on things above, not on the things of this earth. For you are, verse 3, you're what? Dead. You're dead. For you're dead, not physically. He's talking about you're dead to the old sinful life that once controlled every part of you. He says, for you are dead. And your life, your new life, your real life is hid with Christ in God. He is your life. And you can die to some old things that once tried to control you. You can die to old habits, right? Things that used to try to manipulate and control us and sinful tugs and urges against us. And he says, when we were risen with Christ, we have died to that old sinful nature. There's a fellow... Wonderful fellow. It'd be worth a little study uh, from a history perspective. A fellow by the name of George Mueller. You can uh, search him on the internet. You can read, you know, uh, books about him. There's even some movies that actually shows him in them. But George Mueller was a phenomenal man of God who the supernatural, and I'm not talking about some weird and wacky something, but I'm talking about the real genuine move of God happened in this man's life on a regular basis. And he uh, oversaw an orphanage. And he, in his life, took care of tens of thousands of children. And he taught them how to dress properly, and they ironed their clothes and all. He took really good care of them, you know, uh, physically, medically, and all. And all these children, they learned to read and write. They learned God's word and all. And George Mueller never in his entire life ever asked a living soul for a dime to help his orphanage. And he had hundreds Hundreds of children in his orphanage. But what he did, he was a man who had the high ground with God at his side. And he would pray and he would talk to God. And, and this man was a tremendous inspiration to Susan and I when we first got married and went off to Bible school. His lifestyle inspired us. And he would pray. And this was not uh, a one time kind of an incident, but all kinds of things were always happening that became just the natural, but they were really supernatural. One morning, they had hundreds of kids at this long, these long tables in their cafeteria, and they sat down, and they were already 
dressed properly. They had already made up their beds. You know, they had already, you know, uh, you know, charted their course for that whole day of schooling and all. And they sat there and there wasn't any food at all in the kitchen. And a knock came to the door. And see, George Miller, he knew God and he knew what God had called him to do. And there was a knock came at the door and they opened the door and there was a, a man dressed in white, white hat. And he says, sir, he said, my truck just broke down. It's a milk truck. He said, I've got all kinds of milk and cheese and eggs and all kinds of produce and goods on there. And they're not going to be able to come to tonight to fix my truck. Is there any way you could use any of this so it don't just go bad? And he says, oh, yes, sir, I think we could put that to use. Thank you. But things like that, well, that's just natural, you know. It was a supernatural way that God always, always provided for him and his kids. And, and, and I shared that with you about George Miller. You do your own research about him. A phenomenal, inspiring man. But here's something, a little article to, to help you see why that happened. To the one who asked George Miller, he said, could you tell me the secret of your service? how successful it was. And he said, George Miller said, there was a day when I died, utterly died. And as he spoke, he bent lower and lower and lower and lower until he almost touched the floor. He said, I died to George Mueller. Now George Mueller was saying this. He said, I died to George Mueller, to his opinions his preferences, his taste and will. I died to the world around me. It's approval or censure. Died to the approval or blame, even of my brethren and my friends. And since then, I have studied only to show myself approved unto God. He said, I died. Now, there's a new term that we often talk about in our our, our age, you know, with all the technology we have, and we, we call these things selfies, right? You know, it's all about the selfies. And, and George Mueller said, I died to my selfies. <laughs> it's all about God and it's all about others. It's all about people. Lord, we just hear an emergency vehicle off in the distance. And Father, we ask that you bless those people. Somebody maybe that we know is in trouble and we ask that you would help them and you would help those who are responding right now. Give them wisdom to care for them and, and draw them all closer to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, it wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. Picture mired. Maybe you're on a farm out there and you got big old rubber boots on and you're out there, you know, and you're walking in this muck and this mire and the mud and, and there's a lot of animals around. So it's not only mud, you know, and you're up to your knees almost in all this and you're almost stuck. Or maybe you're driving in the mud with your truck and, and you know, you're out here and it just like the bottom falls out. Your, 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 your axle, the you know, the chassis of your car is sitting on the mud. The tires are spinning. They're not touching anything. I mean, you are, you are stuck. Well, picture that as we read this. It says, it wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. We were stuck in sin. It controlled our lives. He says, you let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. Now, have you ever heard of... Um, let me see, what was the name of that program? There was this guy. He was always calling his wife Dingbat. <laughs> what was it called? <laughs> Wait a minute, one person. I can't hear all of you. All in the family. In the family. Now, is that where you're going to learn how to develop a family? <laughs> it's talked about all in the family. What was the guy's name? Archie Bunker, is he not the role model of a husband and a father? <laughs> and his uh, son-in-law, what, what's his name? Yes. Meathead. Yeah, that's a role model you want to use for a family. <laughs> right? So you pick out a television program, 
And we learn from all those about life, right? I don't think so. It might have been entertaining, but it's not a good role model. Well, it says here, it wasn't so long ago that we were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, like, you know, all in the family, you let them tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief. You fill your lungs with this pollution called unbelief and worry and fear and anxiety, and then you exhale disbelief. We all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing. All of us have done that. When we felt like doing it, we did it. All of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with a whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, God, he embraced us. He took our sin dead lives and he, he made he made, nothing we did, he made us alive in Christ. He did all this on his own with no help from us. And then he picked us up and he set us down in highest heaven. We're talking about high ground here. He did this. He set us down. He picked us up. He forgave us. He set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Another translation, it says, we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Not when we die and get to heaven, but now we're seated in heavenly places. You can access the high ground now. And it's a surrender to God. You know, when a little kid goes, okay, mommy, daddy, whatever you want, I'll do it. Can I sit at the big people's table now? I'm not going to throw peas no more. I'm not going to put spaghetti all over my head no more. I'm going to do it your way, mommy. I'm going to do it your way, daddy. You know what I'm talking about? There's a surrender. And with the sender, uh, a surrender, God says he'll pick us up and he'll put us in the highest heaven. And that's, that's our position, our, our seating with him now. Not that we die and go there, although we do die to our own self. And we let him live in us and, and through us. Amen. So let me see where I was at. Verse 7 says, it says, now God has us where he wants us, seated in this heavenly place in relationship with Christ. Now God has us where he wants us with all the time in the world and the next world to shower grace, his unmerited favor, his enabling power, and to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Talking about in relationship with Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. You can't save yourself. You can try, what I hear most of the time, people go, yeah, when I get to heaven, God's going to measure my good and my bad. He's going to weigh them. And if I got enough good, he's going to let me in. See, that's based in upon what you can do. And see, we just can't do enough good. We just can't. He says, saving is all his idea and his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's, what's that next word? It's God's gift. You don't buy a gift. You have to accept the gift. It says it's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we did the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both, the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does. The good work he has gotten ready for us to do. Work we had better be doing. That's the high ground. You know, if, if we're not doing the work that God created us, we're still clinging to the high chair. We want me, myself, and I. I want to be in control of my little world right here where I'm incarcerated at. I've lost my freedom here. I'm in the high chair. I'm being contained here. I can see the high ground that other people are getting higher and higher, but I'll never experience the freedom of it. On a spiritual level, where do you see yourself? Are you, are you holding the high ground or are you clinging to the high chair on a spiritual level? 
How do you see yourself? Listen to what it says here in Psalms, verse 18, 32. It says, God arms me with strength, and he makes my way perfect. How does he make my way perfect? His ways are higher than mine. He teaches me his ways. God arms me with strength, and he makes my way perfect. I learn his ways. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, enabling me to stand on mountain heights. I don't do it. He makes me sure-footed. He makes me like a deer. He does that for me when I've surrendered, and he lifts me up, you see. He wants me to lay hold of the high ground and find him by my side. It's when I've surrendered, and it's no longer my will, but it's, it's his will be done. And then in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 17, it says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms. Now, if you're a farmer, that's kind of important that you, you have uh, a very prosperous year of figs. It says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there's no grapes on the vine, there ain't no grapes there, man. You're not going to get grapes to another year. You hear the way he starts it off here and have back at 317? Even though he's talking about something. It's, it's very interesting how he, even though big trees have no blossoms, there's no grapes on the vine. What's the next words? Even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren. What's the next two words? Even though the flocks die in the fields. The cows and the sheep and the goats, all the livestock, the chickens, the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. You know what this is? You familiar with Murphy's Law? Whatever can go wrong will go wrong. This is a perfect Murphy's Law. Everything can possibly go wrong has happened here. And it's tempting when Murphy's Law kicks into gear and everything can possibly go wrong, has gone wrong, it's really tempting to take the low ground, is it not? Take that low ground. And I've had some people tell me, it's like, well, you know, and they're complaining and they're moaning and groaning and belly aching and going, well, Pastor Ross, this is another, and I'm doing pretty good, you know, under the circumstances. And I'm going like, what are you doing under the circumstances? Get out from underneath there. Amen. And you're going like, how do, I, how do I do that? Can you do that? You don't have to live under the circumstances. I am telling you, if we learn God's ways, we can get out from under the circumstances and, and God will turn it around and work it together for good in your life. That's what he promises us. That's what he tells us to do. So when everything can go wrong, it's going wrong, and we're under the circumstances, what do we usually do? Complain. Has anybody here ever complained? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> There'll be too much wind moving around here at one time. Well, if you are a complainer, be absolutely positively sure you're clinging to the high chair. It's all about you. You're not really looking and understanding and grasping his ways and the higher ways. It's all about woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo. Are you clinging? I, and and I, I, I pray to God every time that from this day forward that you ever complain. I pray that God would give you a vision of you sitting in this high chair <laughs> with spaghetti all over your head and face, green peas coming out your nose and your ears, and just a big old mess. When you complain, that is not spiritually mature. That is not. That is immaturity. It genuinely is. Listen to what the verse says. We just got to go a little further. Let me back up. Verse 17. Back at 317 says, Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vine, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flock dies in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Whoa, what are you talking about? How can you possibly rejoice when, when it, it don't look like it's good? See, that's maturity. You lay hold of the high ground. And see, circumstances are very temporary, are they not? 
In Corinthians, it tells us while we look at things, you know, that are temporary compared to the things that are eternal. While we look not at things which are seen because they are temporary, but we look at that which is eternal. We look at the things that are not seen with the eye of faith. And you've learned God's thoughts and you've learned God's ways. And things can change just like that. You can begin to operate in the supernatural and God, and I'm not talking about some weird and wacky something. I'm talking about everybody looks, well, that's just natural. Yeah, it is natural, but the timing is absolutely super. Like the milk truck breaking down in front of George Mueller's orphanage there. You know, where we can look and see that God is in control. So if Habakkuk says, when everything can possibly go wrong has gone wrong, verse 18 says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. If nothing else was obtained from God is the forgiveness of our sins and that we will spend eternity in heaven with him, that would be enough. But that's not all he promises. He had promised that he'll be with us and he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. And he'll turn the troubled times into good times. You remember the scriptures we read the last two weeks that we were talking about where he talked about the trouble is small potatoes, you know, compared because it's such a fleeting thing and it changes so quickly. Well, let me read you verse 19 here. Verse 19 in Habakkuk 3 says, the Lord God... The Lord God, he's my strength. He's my personal bravery. He's my invincible army. He makes my feet like hind's feet. Hind or deer is what he's talking about. The roebuck and all. He says he, he does it. We don't do it. He makes my feet like hind's feet. Yeah, they, they're able to climb into the high mountains, you see. They, they can go on those rocks and all. And he says, he makes my feet like hind's feet and will make me to walk, not stand still in terror. You, you know what happens? Something happens in our life and we panic. <sighs> and we're just frozen in panic and we don't know what to do. You know, we're just in this panic. We're, we're like the deer caught in the headlights mentality. And we panic and we freeze and we can't move. Listen to what he says. He says, he makes my feet like the hind's feet and will make me to walk, not stand still in terror, but to walk and make spiritual progress upon my high places. Now, you think, well, the high places is a piece of cake, you know. No, it's not. It's difficult to climb that mountain. It's difficult to gain the high ground, but you have the advantage, a tremendous advantage, and you have the closeness of Almighty God. There's trouble in getting there. There's suffering in getting there, and, and there's great responsibility, but you can have it if you want it. And listen to what he says here. And he says that he makes my feet like hind's feet and will make me to walk, not stand still in terror, but to walk and make spiritual progress upon my high places of Trouble of suffering and responsibility. See, if there's difficulty, but let me tell you, oh, reaching the high ground, the reward is so much sweeter. And I'm going to tell you, it's a lot better being on the high ground than bound to the high chair. Spiritually, where do you see yourself? You want to, well, my prayer's getting answered. You ever have difficulty getting your prayers answered? Anybody ever complain because of God's timing on answering your prayers? Anybody? Don't put your hands up. Okay. <laughs> let, me, let me read you. And let me tell you one of God's ways. And this is just one of the many, 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 many ways that God reveals to us to understand him. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, it says, Then he, this is talking about an angel. An angel came to Daniel and was speaking to, to Daniel. It says, And then this angel, he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray, since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourselves before God, your request has been heard in heaven from the first day. Now, it goes along with, uh, what is it? Uh, um, 1 John chapter 4 or 5, verse 14 and 15, it says, and this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, I'm quoting it word for word. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we have the petition that we requested of him. 
So would you like to know from beyond a shadow of a doubt that God heard you? Well, here's an angel saying, the first day you prayed, Daniel, your prayer was heard in heaven. That's what he just got through saying here. He says, let me read one more time. Then he said, this angel, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you begin to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God. And you remember, uh, we actually descend to high ground. We humble ourselves because God, he resists the proud, but he gives grace and he exalts the humble. So as we humble ourselves before God, he lifts us up, you see. And he said here, he makes my feet like hind's feet. No, I'm, I'm, I'm way off, 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 out of track here. Let me get back to Daniel here. It says, since the first day you begin to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God, your request has been heard in heaven. And he says, I have come in answer to your prayer. Did you know that sometimes God sends an angel to deliver your request? But don't, don't, don't misunderstand this. I have heard people praying to angels and telling their angels to bring them money to pay their bills. And the angels do. It ain't your business to tell any angel what to do. The Bible says as we have entertained strangers, sometimes we've entertained angels unaware. But that's God's business, not our business to tell angels what to do. But he says, I have come in answer to your prayer. But verse 13 says, but for 21 days, that's how long it's been since Daniel prayed. And his prayer was heard in heaven on the first day. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. The powers of darkness, Satan's crowd, blocked the way of an angel that God had sent to deliver an answer to prayer to Daniel. And then it says, and then Michael, one of the archangels, y'all have heard of him, he came to help me. See, I don't know if you understand, there is a real battlefield in, in heaven. You go, no, read your Bible. It says he gives us the helmet of salvation. He gives us the breastplate of righteousness. He gives us the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. Our loins are girt with truth. We got these boots of peace. Uh, so he has equipped us because there's a real battle going on against the powers of darkness against us. And he says here, he says, and then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me and... And I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now, how did he get free? Michael and his angelic host under him were fighting off the powers of darkness so this other angel could go and answer the prayer. He wasn't the answerer. He was only carrying the answer to that prayer. What I'm saying is this. It's like, oh, I, I didn't know that. His ways are higher than ours. We don't understand the delay sometimes. You pray about something two days, well, what the heck with it? God didn't heard me. He don't ever pay any attention to me. And what are you doing? You're in the high chair complaining. You got spaghetti all over your face. Green peas running out your nose. Boogers and all of that. You're just a big old mess. You're clinging to the high chair instead of trying to understand the high ground and laying hold of the high ground in your relationship with Almighty God. Learning to be patient. Because without patience, faith don't exist. Amen. Our father of faith, Abraham, it says, Father Abraham, he obtained all the promises of God after he had patiently endured. So patience is key to planting a garden. Patience is key to hunting. Patience is key to catching a fish. Patience is important in every area of our life. And it's a display of faith. That's just the way it is. Well, he says here, in James chapter 4, verse 4, it says, you are cheating God if all you want is your own way. Mine, 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 mine. Throw a tantrum. I don't get my way. Is that what you do? Does that represent your spiritual maturity? Do you think you can shame God into answering your prayers? Well, if God don't love me no better, he don't take care of me, he don't do that, he don't do that. Wah, 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 wah. We throw a little tantrum. Why don't we learn his ways? Maybe, maybe you was on the threshold of receiving your prayers answered. And then you just blew it. Let's learn his ways. Let's learn his thoughts. Let's apply them to our own life. That's what I'm talking about. He says, you're, you're cheating on God. If all you want is your own way. 
flirting with the world, every chance you get, you end up enemies of God and enemies of his way. And do you suppose that God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he's a fiercely jealous lover. God's crazy about you. He loves you. He is crazy about you. He genuinely does. It says the proverb has it that he is, he is a fiercely jealous lover. And what he gives in love, what God gives in love to us, his children, is far better than anything else you'll find anywhere. When you make it a point to put God first in your life, it tells us in Matthew 6, seek first God and his kingdom and all the other things that you need in life will come looking for you, will be added to you. That's what the Bible says. And what he gives in love is far better than anything else you'll find. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willful proud. And you know what pride is, don't you? Let's see if we can spell it together. P R I D E. What's the middle letter in pride? I. I. That's the problem. Pride is all about me. And he says right here, um, it's common knowledge that God goes against the willful proud and God gives grace. His unmerited favor is enabling power to the willing humble. Verse 7, last verse we're going to look at today. James 4, 7, it says, so let God work his will in you. Don't resist God's will. But let's do what Jesus did as he was on that mountain praying the, the night before he was crucified. You remember when he said, oh, Lord, Father, could you let this, this cup of suffering pass for me? It seems too much to bear. But he didn't put an exclamation mark there. He put a comma. Lord, if this, if this thing could pass for me, but not my will be done. Your will, thy will be done. Amen. He surrendered to his father. 100% and totally. So, James 4, 7 says, so let God's work. So let God work his will in you. Uh, don't resist him. And then it says, yell a loud, what's that word? No, no to the devil. Does the devil ever tempt you to do things you ought not to do? Well, it says, yell a loud, what's that word? No. no. Getting better at it. <clears throat> Yell aloud. No. no to the devil. He is trying to kill, steal, and destroy you. He wants you to be bound to this high chair for the rest of your life and never experience spiritual maturity. He doesn't want you to ever access the supernatural. He doesn't want your faith to move mountains. And, and, and the scripture says, let's try one more time. It says, yell aloud. No, no. to the devil. And watch him scamper, which means flee, run away. And say a quiet yes to God. You know, the Bible says God speaks to us in a still small voice. And you're in a situation in a public place, and maybe you can't say nothing too loud, but you can under your breath say, Lord, I surrender to you. Yes, I'm yours. I need your help. Let's try this. It says, Say a quiet, it's a firm, but it's not arrogant, it's not demanding, it's a surrender. It says, say a quiet yes. Let's try it one more time. Let's say a quiet yes to God. Let's just talk about a total surrender. And he'll be there in no time. He'll be there in no time. And then it says, quit dabbling, quit experimenting in sin. We experiment with it. But what we don't understand is that, that mousetrap, that cheese is not just there for free. And that worm ain't there it's there for free, you know, for the guy who's fishing. There's a in that mousetrap and there's a hook in that worm. You know what I'm talking about? And he says, quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. You ever seen playing the field? I looked it up. I wanted to make sure I understood it. And it said, play in the field is flirting to have an interest in a number of people or things, especially to be romantically and sexually involved with a number of, of partners. Play in the field. No commitment anywhere. And he's telling us to quit playing the field. 
Make a commitment to him. Put him first in your life. He created you, and he knows what makes you tick, and he knows what will satisfy you, and he has already thought out what it is that, that would make you happy in this world. And every good thing you've ever experienced, it all came from him, even if you didn't know that's where it came from. The beautiful sunrise. Anybody see the sunrise this morning? Some of you are going like it didn't rise this morning. <laughs> if you were up early enough, was it up? It was fantastic. And along with it was a little sliver, the smallest little sliver of moon that was glowing orange that I saw this morning also. God put that there for us to enjoy. Even if you missed it, he put it there for you, okay? So I can tell you about how beautiful it was this morning, okay? And Randy can tell you. Okay. Well, you know, uh, final, final passage here. I'm going to read verse, uh, verse 9. It says, get serious, really serious. Verse 10, it says, get down on your knees before your master. Get down on your knees before the master. It's, on, it's the only way you'll get on your feet. What? Get down on your knees before your master. It's the only way to get on your feet. This is how we descend to high ground. We walk in humility. We humble ourselves. We choose to learn his ways and his thoughts. This is the manufacturer's handbook, you see. God created us, and he knows what makes us tick. And this is how we learn to be a, a husband, a wife, a mother, uh, a father. This is how we learn how to do anything in life. We learn his ways. It's, fan, it's relevant. It's not old oh, and archaic. We can learn his ways and it clicks with us. And we are satisfied. And I'll tell you what, when you gain the, the advantage, the high ground, oh, and you look down here, nobody wants the bondage of a high chair anymore. It's okay for kids that are two or three years old, I suppose. Probably three might even be pushing it, you know. And some kids get out a lot earlier, don't they? Mommy, I want to do it your way. I want to sit at the big table, you know. And show me how to do it right. Let's let God instruct us and show us. I promise you this. God's not looking to be a party pooper. He's not looking to steal any joy from you. He's looking to protect you. And you learn the right ways. And you will find a satisfaction and a peace and a joy that nothing else in this world provides. Well, our time is up. Would you bow your heads with me? <laughs> Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. And I ask that you would work in our room right here right now and that you would work a miracle in the men and women's lives and those in the balcony and those who are downstairs in our, our cafe watching on the big screen. Lord, we ask that you minister to all and all those who are watching online. And Lord, if you would show us how to lay hold of the high ground. Lord, how we can access the supernatural so we can learn how to get our prayers answered. We can learn how to work with you and how to represent you and how to find fulfillment and satisfaction and peace in our life right now. Lord, we ask that you would help us to discover whatever it is that we need, whether it's health or wealth or, 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 or healed emotions or relationship. Lord, show us your way. Lead us and guide us in the right way that would honor you and bring fulfillment in our own lives. Bless my brothers and sisters who hear this right now and change us, Lord. Set us free from the high chair and let us lay hold of the high ground. Now, as our heads are still bowed, I would ask you to join me if you would. Those of you who know Christ already, would you reaffirm your faith in a fantastic, wonderful Savior? And maybe you don't know him in a real way. Maybe if you're watching online and you've, you've never really surrendered to God. But I'd ask you to pray with me today and, and do just that and allow him into your life. Would you pray with me right now? Would you pray? Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I, believe I believe that you love me. I believe you have great plans for my life. I and I believe the best is yet to come. I believe that Jesus died in my place. And I believe he rose from the dead. I believe he's knocking at the door of my heart. I open wide that door. And I welcome Jesus. 
into my life as my Savior, as my Lord, and as my King. I'm sorry, dear Lord, for so much time I've spent in the high chair, but I want to lay hold of the high ground in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.